So the focus is going to be on how to facilitate a field delivery. I did not say to deliver a baby in the field, facilitate, because regardless of whether or not you're present, once that baby ready to come in coming, right? So it's going to focus on that and also how to resuscitate a newborn if the need arise. Let's get into it. All right. <clears throat> Most deliveries occur in a hospital setting, right? Occasionally, the pregnant woman is unable to get to a hospital. You must then decide whether to assist the delivery on scene or if there is enough time to, to transport the patient. All right, so let's review the anatomy and physiology of the female reproductive system. So you have the ovaries, right? And the ovaries have about 400,000 follicles, 200,000 on each side. Each of these follicles can produce one oocyte, right? Uh, the, that's the egg. Every month, about 20, 20 of these follicles will um, go through what we would classify as a matura maturation um, process. <clears throat> but when the oocyte fully becomes a ovum, one follicle will release it. So a single follicle will release it and it alternates. So if the right side release it this month next month the left side will release it and the female is born with all the eggs that she will need for the rest of her life for the rest of her life sorry right now once the mature egg which is the ovum is released if it is it will travel down the fallopian tube as it travels <clears throat> when it becomes fertilized by the sperm, it is referred to as a zygote, then it implants within the, the uterus, and we, we, it goes through the, the embryonic stage, develops into a fetus, and eventually we get the baby being delivered. All right, now the Uterus is a primary organ where the, the fetus will develop. The cervix is between that passageway between the uterus and the vagina. The ovaries are two gland, glands, one on each side of the uterus, similar in function to the male testes. Each ovary contains thousands of follicles and each follicle contains an egg. Ovulation occurs approximately two weeks prior to menstruation. The fallopian tubes extend out laterally from the uterus with one tube associated with each ovary. Fertilization usually occurs when a sperm meets the egg inside the fallopian tube. The fertilized egg continues to the uterus where it, if implantation occurs, it develops into an embryo and then a fetus and it grows until delivery. The uterus is a muscular organ that encloses and protects the developing fetus as it grows for approximately nine months. It produces contractions during labor it helps to push the fetus through the bird canal. The bird canal is made up of the vagina and the lower third of the uterus. This is called the, the cervix, right? Which is basically the receptacle for the penis and also the passage for menstrual flow and where the baby will come out. All right. 
right? Note on this diagram where the fundus is, that's the top portion of the, the uterus, right? So you need to know where the, the fundus is. It, it can be used to um, estimate the gestational period. The vagina is the outermost cavity of the female reproductive system and forms the lower part of the birth canal. It completes the passageway from the uterus to the outside world. The perineum is the area of skin between the vagina and the anus. That's another area that you need to look out for because if it's an explosive birth, it can tear. And if it tear, you'll get a lot of hemorrhaging. Right? So you need to support the perineum when facilitating a field delivery. The breasts produce milk that is carried through small ducts to the nipple to provide nourishment to the newborn once it is born. Early signs of pregnancy in the breasts includes increased size and they become tender. All right, now the placenta at about four weeks, the placenta will form, right? And the placenta acts as a liver for the, the fetus. It um, also acts as the fetal lung. It produces antibodies. It transports nutrients and excrete waste, right? So it's the line for the fetus as it develops. So the placenta attaches to the uterine wall and connects to the fetus by the um, umbilical or umbi, umbilical cord, depending on how you want to pronounce it. The placental barrier consists of two layers of cell. Now, anything ingested by a pregnant woman has the potential to affect the fetus. So nutrients, oxygen, waste, carbon dioxide, many toxins, most medications, right? Once ingested by the, the pregnant woman, it can have effects on the fetus. After delivery, the placenta separates from the uterus and delivers. The umbilical cord is the lifeline of the fetus. <clears throat> it has one vein, two arteries. The umbilical vein carries oxygen, oxygenated blood from the placenta to the fetus. And the umbilical arteries carry the oxygenated blood from the fetus to the placenta. The fetus develops inside a fluid-filled bag-like membrane called the amniotic sac. Contains 500 to 1,000 mils of amniotic fluid. Right? And the sac acts as an insulator and a protector for the, the fetus. Fluid is released in a gush when the sac ruptures, usually at the beginning of labor. All right, so let's look at that's the review of the anatomy and physiology. Let's look at the changes, right? Normal changes that can occur during the pregnancy. Now, many normal changes occur in the body that are not all directly related to the reproductive system. So re respiratory, cardiovascular, and musculoskeletal system can go through changes. Hormone levels increase to support fetal development and prepare the body for childbirth. As the fetus de develops and grows, the uterus will also grow. As the size of the uterus increases, so, so does the amount of fluid that is present within the amniotic sac. The uterus and organs are shifted from their normal position, and sometimes that shift can cause the, the diaphragm to move upwards, so they tend to breathe faster. <clears throat> Matter of fact, if you find them with a normal breeding rate, that can be something of significant concern because their breeding rate will go up. If you find them with a breeding rate of 20, 
they might be in trouble. <clears throat> now, rapid uterine growth occurs during the second trimester. As the uterus grows, it pushes up on the diaphragm and displaces it. Respiratory capacity changes with increased respiratory rate and decreased minute volume. That's what I just mentioned. Their blood volume is going to increase significantly as well. So blood volume gradually increases to allow for adequate perfusion of the uterus, prepare for blood loss during childbirth. The num number of red blood cells increases, the speed of clotting increases, and the patient's heart rate is going to increase by 20%. So you might see tachycardia in this, these patients and might not be anything of concern, right? <clears throat> in the third trimester, so you have three trimesters, right? And full term would be about um, 38 weeks of gestation, right? That's full term. So it's 38 weeks divided into three trimesters calculated from when the pregnant woman uh, the first day after, is it, wait, go again. After she, the day after, is it the day before or the day after? Come on, right. After seeing the last menstrual cycle, yeah. Brain, brain freeze at, at that point. So it's three, three trimesters, first, second, and third, 38 weeks is what we would consider um, normal. All right, now in the third trimester, there's an increased risk of vomiting and potential aspiration following trauma. Due to changes in gastrointestinal motility and displacement of the stomach upward, right? Changes in the cardiovascular system and increased demands of supporting the fetus increase the workload of the heart. Not all women are healthy when they begin pregnancy. Cardiac compromise is life-threatening possibility, right? And if the pregnant woman, pregnant woman's body started to go into shock, it will protect her over the fetus, right? So it's gonna try and save her, not the fetus. So if we can do a good job in saving the mom, we will be able to save the, the baby, right? Once they're close to full term. Now, weight gain during pregnancy is normal, right? They can gain, gain up to 27 pounds. So weight gain will challenge the heart and impact the musculoskeletal system. The joints are going to become loose and, and less stable, so they are at risk of falling, right? And when they, are, when they fall, it can result in serious complications. Changes in the body center of gravity increases the risk of slips and falls. All right, now that's the normal um, changes that occur. Now we will look at complications. So most pregnant women are healthy. Some may be ill when they conceive or become ill as a result of the pregnancy, right? So they can be sick before or they can develop illnesses as a result of the pregnancy. Use oxygen to treat any heart or lung disease in a pregnant patient. All right, so diabetes, they can develop gestational diabetes. Develops during pregnancy in many women who have not had it previously. And it's because of some hormonal um, changes. Gestational diabetes usually resolves after delivery, right? usually, but they can develop um, diabetes permanently after as well. The treatment is going to be the same as for any other patient with diabetes, right? So it's the same treatment. What you must antis anticipate, though, is that 
if it's a diabetic um, pregnant woman, expect a large baby. That baby is not going to be small, right? Baby might be nine or 10 pounds or close to 10 pounds, right? So this mother would be at risk for an explosive birth and tearing. So we got to be prepared for that. All right, then you have hypertensive disorders. So they can develop preeclampsia, which is pregnancy-induced hypertension, right? So this is when they, they develop um, hypertension after the 20th week of gestation. And this can cause significant issues with the growth and development of the fetus, right? It can cause issues with liver, and the, the kidneys, it can um, put the, the mother at risk for pulmonary edema. And worst case scenario, if it is not corrected, the mother can start to have seizures. Now, when the mother start to get seizures, this is what we call eclampsia. So preeclampsia is the hypertension. That's not the only finding, but that's a key finding, right? They will also start to spill um, protein in their urine. They start to get fluid accumulating in the legs. They can start to develop um, visual um, light sensitivity or visual disturbances. Right? But one of the key things you need to look for is the, the elevated blood pressure. Right, so preeclampsia is pregnancy-induced hypertension <clears throat> developed after the 20th week of gestation. Signs and symptoms include severe hypertension, that's a key one, severe or persistent headache, visual abnormalities. Look out for the visual abnormalities if they start to tell you that they're having um, issues with light. Be prepared for seizures. Swelling in the hands, feet, and anxiety. Now, as I stated before, if the preeclampsia is not managed properly, they can start to have seizures. This is what we call eclampsia. So eclampsia is characterized by seizures that occur as a result of hypertension. To treat seizures caused by eclampsia, lie the patient on her left side. So once they are close to full term, we do not put them flat, right? You're gonna put them in what we would call the left lateral recumbent position. If you put them flat, you're, the weight of the, the um, uterus and the fetus is gonna come down on the blood vessels. So you can actually cause the, the venous return to decrease, so the, the blood pressure drops. I remember what I said, Previously, if the mother starts to go into shock, her body will protect her, not the fetus. All right, so treat seizures caused by eclampsia, lie the patient on her left side, maintain her earway, administer supplemental oxygen if necessary. If vomiting occurs, suction the earway, provide rapid transport, call for ALS. So once you're in an ALS, response system or a part of you need to request ALS early right because medication is what is needed to stop this seizure right and it has to be a specific medication as well <clears throat> excuse me all right now transporting the patient on our left side can also prevent supine hypotensive syndrome caused by compression of the descending aorta and the inferior vena cava by the pregnant uterus when the patient lies supine. So hypertension may result. We try to avoid putting them supine if they are close to full term. All right, now let's look at bleeding complications. All right, and one of the most common causes of internal bleeding in the the first trimester is an ectopic pregnancy, right? So any feel of childbearing age that presents with severe abdominal pain, 
you want to find out if they are pregnant, right? Because worst case would be ectopic pregnancy, which is where the, the fetus develops outside of the uterus. So they are not developing within the uterus. And one of the places that they can start to develop is in the fallopian tube. And as it grow, it will exceed the size of the fallopian tube and it can rupture and result in significant blood loss. And this can kill the patient, right? This can definitely kill the patient. Now, leading cause of maternal death in the first trimester. So make a note, ectopic pregnancy, first trimester. Now, leading cause of maternal death in the first trimester is internal hemorrhage following rupture of an ectopic pregnancy. Consider the possibility in a woman who has missed a menstrual cycle and complains of sudden severe pain in the lower abdomen. Very important slide. Hemorrhage from the vagina that occurs before labor begins may be serious, may be a sign of spontaneous abortion or miscarriage. This is more um, second trimester. So <clears throat> a miscarriage or abortion is when the, the fetus is spontaneously released, or the fetus is released before um, 20, the 20th week of gestation. It can be intentional, it can be spontaneous, right? In a show placenta, the placenta separates prematurely from the wall of the uterus, right? No, placenta abruptio and placenta previa will occur more in the third trimester. So it's a third trimester, right? So placenta, abruptio, abruptio placenta is when the, the placenta separates prematurely from the, the walls of the uterus. This can cause significant blood loss, right? And it can result in death of the fetus. In placenta previa, the placenta is at the, the cervical opening. So it's at the, the um, vaginal opening. That's where the placenta is developing. So the passageway for the, the fetus to come out has been blocked. That's placenta previa, right? So here's a diagram of that. This would be, this would be placenta abruptio, right? And this is placenta previa. And as I said, both will occur in the third trimester. All right, abortion, passage of the fetus and placenta before 20 weeks may be spontaneous or induced. Most serious complications are bleeding and infection, high risk for infection, right? And it can lead to sepsis. And this is quite common in Jamaica. It's actually very common, right? Um, induced abortion is common here. And sometimes it's not done properly. So a portion of the fetus remains or a part of the placenta was not removed properly and it results in serious infection and they develop sepsis, right? So sepsis as a result of um, incomplete abortion is common here in Jamaica. Now, more serious complications, bleeding and infection. If the woman is in shock, treat and transport her promptly to the hospital. No abuse. Now, pregnant women have an increased chance of being victims of domestic violence and abuse. Abuse increases the chance of spontaneous abortion, premature delivery, and low birth weight. 
The woman is at risk from bleeding, infection, and uterine rupture. Use calm, professional approach. Pay attention to the environment for, sign, for any signs of abuse. Talk to the patient in a private area away from the potential abuser, if possible, right? And I've had this experience in the field. And sometimes the women don't want to talk right they don't want to talk because i can remember having a, a pregnant patient and when i when we got there she was complaining of severe abdominal pain um but she she was very hesitant to give information around her partner so something wasn't right she wasn't able to give me a clear history of what was going on Right, and I realized that she was also um, abusing drugs. And <clears throat> so I decided that I needed to talk to her um, privately. So I brought her in the unit and I said, just give me a couple minutes with her. I started talking to her and she, she broke down and she said, her partner is abusing her physically and she's, she's on drugs and no, the protocol is once they they state that information you have to get the police involved so police was contacted police came however when the police um came in and started to question the young lady all of a sudden she didn't speak english she's only spanish she talking so i said okay she doesn't want to to give him up and it, it, it affected my ability to provide appropriate treatment for the patient because I was getting two different stories. So I, I didn't know which pathway to go with my treatment. So I had to just focus on the basic ABCs, right? So sometimes they won't give them up. They can be as a result of fear. It can be as a result of dependency, right? But it happens. Now, substance abuse effects of addiction on the fetus include prematurity, low birth weight, severe respiratory distress, death, right? So if they're abusing drugs, the fetus can have withdrawal symptoms when they are born, right? That is something to anticipate. And once they have that, your focus when the deliver is going to be managing their airway. That's really what you gotta do. Manage the airway, maintain their body heat. <clears throat> now, fetal alcohol syndrome describes the condition of infants born to women who have abused alcohol. Substance abuse. Pay special attention to your safety. Wear eye protection, a face mask, and gloves at all times. Look for clues that you are dealing with an addicted patient. The newborn will probably need immediate resuscitation. As I said, prepare to manage their airway, maintain body heat. All right, now special considerations for trauma and pregnancy. With trauma call involving, sorry, with a trauma call involving a pregnant woman, you have two patients. You have the woman, you have the unborn fetus. Trauma to a pregnant woman may have a direct effect on the fetus, right? So it can have a direct effect, it can have an indirect effect. So that area can be directly damaged. Or the mother, based on the injuries that the mother receives, her body is going into shock, tries to protect her, so it diverts whatever supply is feeding the fetus to her to keep her alive. Now, pregnant women may be victims of assaults, motor vehicle crashes, shootings. Pregnant women also have an increased risk of falling. Right? Now, one of the most common causes of placenta abruption is trauma. That's, that's one of the most common causes, right? So placenta abruption is associated with trauma, right? 
So you need to be looking out for that if they are close to full term and they're going into shock in a traumatic injury. <clears throat> they can produce a lot of um, blood loss. And one of the key things that you look for is the mother will tell you that she don't feel the baby moving anymore. She's not feeling the baby move, right? Which is a, a very hard call to deal with, right? Now, pregnant women have an increased amount of overall total blood volume, right? And a 20% increase in heart rate may experience a significant amount of blood loss before you will see signs of shock, right? So if there is blood loss, don't wait until you're seeing signs of shock to start managing the patient as if she's going into shock. When you can see the signs and symptoms of shock, it means that her body is protecting her now. It's not gonna protect the fetus. The uterus is vulnerable to penetrating trauma and blunt injuries. When a pregnant woman is involved in a motor vehicle crash, severe hemorrhage may occur from injuries to the uterus. Trauma is one of the leading cause, causes of abruptio placenta. Common symptoms include vaginal bleeding, severe abdominal pain, and as I stated before, the mother will tell you she can no longer feel the baby moving. Is, which is very emotional for the, the pregnant mother, right? Trust me. Special considerations for trauma and pregnancy. Improper positioning of seatbelt can result in injury to the pregnant woman and the fetus. Carefully assess a pregnant woman's abdomen and chest for seatbelt marks, bruising, and obvious trauma. All right, now cardiac arrest. Your focus is the same as with other patients, right? However, you have to consider that when the patient is close to full, ter full term, right? If you're going to keep this patient on a CPR board or a spine board, you have to keep the board at an angle where it's not flat. So you can't complete, keep that board completely flat because we need to ease pressure off the venous um, return. That's one consideration. If we're not able to keep the, the mother at an angle, then somebody has to push the fundus, right? Somebody has to push the fundus top portion of the, the uterus to the left, push it over to the left while the compressions are being done, right, to ease that pressure off. You may also have to elevate the, the head of the, of the stretcher. So while they're on that CPR board or spine board, you have to elevate the, the head of the stretcher to cause the, the um, diaphragm to shift back down, right? If you don't, it might be very difficult for you to bag that patient. So these are some things that you, you need to consider. And of course, you will be guided by your local protocol. Now, notify the receiving facility personnel that you are en route with a pregnant trauma patient in cardiac arrest. Now, assessment and management. Your focus is on the woman. Suspect shock based on the MOI. Be prepared for vomiting and aspiration. Attempt to determine the gestational age to assist you with determining the size of the fetus and the position of the uterus, if you have been taught to do that. So usually they say if the fundus is below the navel, that's about 12 to 16 weeks of um, gestation, which is an estimation, right? If it's usually, if the fundus is at the navel or umbilical, navel, I don't know why I'm saying umbilical. So if the fundus is at the navel, 
region, there are about 20 to 22 weeks in gestation, and that's an estimation. If it's above, if the fundus is above the, the navel region, then they are close to, to full term, right? And usually once it's above the, the navel region, they have a chance, right? So they have a chance, meaning the, the fetus is, has a chance of um, viability if they are delivered or if emergency C-section has to be done, right? Now, if you find that the pregnant mother is obviously dead, continue to do CPR on her, right? The fetus might have a chance if you continue to do CPR on that mother until she get to the hospital and they can remove that, that um, the newborn by a C-section. Follow these guidelines when treating a pregnant trauma patient. Maintain an open airway, give high flow oxygen, ensure ad adequate ventilation, assess circulation, transport the, the patient on her left side. All right, now cultural value consideration. Cultural sensitivity is important. Women of some cultures may have a value system that will affect the choice of how they care for themselves during the pregnancy, how they have planned the childbirth process. Some cultures may not permit a male health care provider to assess or examine a female patient. Respect these differences and honor requests from the patient. A competent, rational adult has the right to refuse all or any part of your assessment or care. All right, now, teenage pregnancy. The United States has one of the highest teenage pregnancy rates, right, in the world. Um, the teenage pregnancy rate in Jamaica is pretty high as well. And these are the patients that tend to to, um, I don't even want to say cause problems, but you'll have some challenges with these patients because usually they have not been going to their clinical checkups regularly. Um, <clears throat> they tend to not follow instructions very well. Uh, they, they develop complications and they don't realize that they're having complications. So it can be challenging, right? Pregnant teenagers may not know they are pregnant or may be in denial. Respect the teenager's privacy, assess and obtain history away from her parents. All right, now let's look at the patient assessment. Childbirth is seldom an unexpected event, but there are occasions when it becomes an emergency. Dispatcher will usually ask simple questions to determine whether birth is imminent. Premature contractions may be caused by trauma or medical conditions. So they can develop what is called Braxton Hicks contractions, which is false label, right? So it's really contractions with no cervical dilation. That's what it is. And it can happen under stress it can happen because of medical condition or it can be the uterus is just practicing so it's practicing for the real thing but it's contractions with no cervical dilation and usually they don't increase in intensity with true labor the contractions will increase in intensity all right now scene size up scene safety Take standard precaution. Gloves and eye and face protections are a minimum if delivery is already begun or is in or is complete. <clears throat> if time allows, a gown should also be used. If time allows, right? So you may not have time to put on a gown, and it is more important to deliver the baby safely than to put on a gown. Always have a backup uniform. Always. 
consider calling for additional resources. Mechanism of injury or nature of illness, you will encounter pregnant patients who are not in labor. So it is important to determine MOI or NOI. Do not develop tunnel vision during a call. I've said this many times to you guys. Don't develop tunnel vision, right? Falls and necessity for spinal immobilization must be considered. Form a general impression. So we're in the primary assessment now. Form a general impression. The general impression should tell you whether the patient is in active labor or whether you have time to assess and address other possible life threats. Perform a rapid examination. When trauma or other medical problems present, evaluate these first, right? We still have to assess airway. We still have to assess breathing. So life-threatening conditions with the woman's airway and breathing are usually not an issue during a, a birth. A motor vehicle crash, assault, or medical condition may cause a life threat. Assess the airway and breathing to ensure they are adequate. Circulation, definitely you need to be looking for signs of external and internal bleeding, right? Because this can be potentially life-threatening, right? So you need to assess this early. Blood loss after delivery is expected, but significant bleeding is not. Assess for and treat life-threatening bleeding. Assess the skin for color, temperature, and moisture. Check the pulse. So the ABs, oh, so far everything seems kind of similar to your adult patients, right? So far. Transport decision. If delivery is imminent, prepare to deliver at the scene. Ideal place to deliver is in the ambulance or the woman's home. If delivery is not imminent, prepare the patient for transport. Provide rapid transport for pregnant patients who have hypertension, right? And remember, once they're hypertensive, they're at risk for seizures, right? Eclampsia. Have altered mental status, have bleeding with significant pain. They require rapid transport. After we have completed the primary, the next phase of our assessment is history taking. No. Your history taking will, will focus on history of the pregnancy and patient history. So history of the pregnancy and the patient's medical history, right? So obtain a thorough obstetric history. You need to know the expected due date. Are there any complications that she is aware of? Has she developed any medical problems as a result of the pregnancy? Did she have any medical issues in previous pregnancies? Did she have a normal delivery or did she require, require a C-section? All of these are important. Are you on any medication as a result of the pregnancy? So history of the pregnancy, right? And a complete medical history. So obtain a sample history. Pertinent history should include questions related specifically to prenatal care, determine the due date, frequency of contractions, a history of previous pregnancies and deliveries, the possibility of multiples, and if she has taken any drugs or medication. If the water is broken, it's important for you to ask her what was the color of it. Was it yellow? Was it greenish? Was it brown? Did it have an unusual odor? So, that can be meconium, which is the first um, waste or stool that they, the fetus pass. And if they pass it while inside the uterus, it can end up in their lungs and they can get um, chemical pneumonia. That's not good. Right? Now, secondary assessment, physical examination. Assess the major body system as needed. Emphasis on chief complaint. Assess for fetal movement. If the patient is in labor, focus on contractions and possibly delivery, right? Now, you have to time the contractions. So you need to time how long the contractions last and the intervals 
between the contraction. So you will use a fundoscope. And you put the fundoscope at the top of the, the uterus, which is the fundus. You can use an, a, a nice stethoscope as well. But back in the days, that's how I was taught to use a fundoscope. I still have my stents that I used as well. Right? And you listen to the fetus heartbeat. It's important that you know the heart rate, right? And that heart rate should be between 120, 160, or up to 180, right? It should not be below 100 or below 120. That should be concerning for you, right? If it's below 120, they might be in distress at that point. Now, when you are going to time the contractions, you put your hands on the, the fundus and you wait until you feel it contract. When you feel it contract, you're going to time how long that contraction lasts. So how long does it stay contracted until it relaxes? You record that time. Don't move your hand. Keep your hand there and note the time that it takes for the next contraction to begin. So you want the length of the contraction and the duration. And usually if the contractions are coming every two to three minutes apart and lasting, I would say, anywhere from 45 to 90 minutes, you might want to start preparing, right? And if you start to see croning, huh, you definitely need to prepare. Now, croning is the, the, the um, in general terms, it is the head of the fetus. So you're seeing the the head of the fetus at the vaginal opening. However, crowning can be considered any presenting part, right? So crowning can be considered to be any presenting part. It must be the head that you're seeing. You might see the amniotic sac. You can see the umbilical cord. You might see a leg. You might see a shoulder, right? So it doesn't necessarily have to be the head that's presenting, but generally speaking, crowning is, is the the head presenting at the vaginal opening, All right? So once the, the contractions are coming frequently and increasing in intensity and there is crowning, more than likely you gotta prepare for a field delivery at that point, All right? So vital signs. Pulse, respiration, skin color, temperature, condition, and blood pressure. Be especially alert for tachycardia, hypo, or hypertension. Hypertension, even mild, may indicate more serious problems. Reassessment, repeat the primary assessment, obtain another set of vital signs, check interventions, and treatment. In most cases, childbirth is a natural process that does not require your assistance, right? So all we are doing is facilitating the process. Whether we present or not, the baby will come out. Now, back in the days when we weren't present, a lot of these babies did not survive. And that's really where we're there. We're there to ensure that the, the process is not um, compromised and the baby deliver safely and we can get them to the hospital safely, right? We're there to facilitate that process. In most cases, oh, I've already read that. When childbirth is complicated by trauma, any interventions you provide, the patient will benefit the, the fetus. I've overstated this. If something is wrong with the, the mother, if you're able to treat the mother well, the fetus will benefit, right? If they, the mother is compromised, her body will try to protect her over the developing fetus. Communication and documentation. If delivery is imminent, notify staff at the receiving hospital. Provide an update on the status of the woman and the newborn after delivery. If delivery does not occur within 30 minutes, provide rapid transport, right? 
for a pregnant patient with a complaint unrelated to childbirth, be sure to include pregnancy status in your radio report. So the number of weeks of gestation, her due date, any known complications of the pregnancy. If delivery occurs in the field, you will have two patient care reports to complete. So that's the patient assessment. Let's look at the stages of labor, right? So you have dilation of the cervix, delivery of the fetus, delivery of the placenta. No, dilation of the cervix is the first stage. Second stage, delivery of the fetus. Third stage, delivery of the placenta. However, how I want you to think about it is you need to know when the, the stages begin and when it ends. So the dilation of the cervix is actually when the first stage begin, sorry, when the first stage ends, right? The beginning of labor is when the, the mother experience <clears throat> what we consider to be lightning. So lightning means the, the baby is moving down into the birth canal. So that pressure eases off the diaphragm and suddenly the mother can breathe better, right? So the mother is now able to breathe much better, right? The mucus plug is expelled and the contractions begin, right? So when the contractions begin and the cer cervix is fully dilated, then the first stage of labor is completed. So it starts with the, the contractions, lightning, contractions, and it ends with cervical dilation. However, as EMTs, you will not be checking for cervical dilation in the field. So you're not gonna be pushing your fingers inside the patient's vagina to check for cervical dilation. So what you're looking for in the first stage or at the end of the first stage is crowning, right? So the first stage for you as a EMS responder is the beginning of the contractions to the point that you are seeing crowning, right? That's the first stage. The second stage begins with crowning and it ends when the baby or newborn is delivered. So the second stage begins with crowning and it ends when the newborn is delivered. The third stage of labor begins with delivery of the newborn and it ends when the placenta is delivered. So you need to know when the stage begin, you need to know when it ends. All right. Now the first stage begins with the onset of contractions and ends when the cervix is fully dilated. You are not going to test for cervical dilation, so look for crowning. Usually the longest stage lasting an average of 16 hours can be less, right? So the entire birth process can actually take place in three hours or less. That's a precipitous birth, right? So usually though, this is the longest stage. Uterine contractions become more regular and last about 30 to 60 seconds each. Frequency and intensity will increase with each contraction. Now, the first stage, labor is generally longer in primi gravida. Now, that the term gravida or uterus, that's what it means. I'm hearing feedback. Okay. So gravida means the uterus is pregnant, right? That's what it means. Para, if you see the term para parity, parity, it means that the mother has gone over 28 weeks of gestation and has delivered the baby. Now in EMS literature, it says live birth, 
right? So in the EMS literature, para means live birth. However, in the medical literature, para is considered the baby is delivered, not necessarily alive, right? So depending on the literature, you will see that. <clears throat> but just understand that para means they have had X amount of birth, meaning the baby was delivered. That's what para means. Gravida means pregnancy. Now, a woman may experience preterm or false labor or Braxton Hicks contraction. You should provide support for the patient, right? So, primigravida, just remember that term, first pregnancy. Multigravida, they have had more than one pregnancy. Usually, when they, they have more than one pregnancy, that uterus is well trained. So that baby ain't gonna stay up there very long. That uterus is ready to go, it has experience, right? So it's gonna be working quite fast. And this table 33-1 shows you the difference between false label, true label. Make a note of that. Now, continuing with the first page, some women experience a premature rupture of the amniotic sac. So it ruptures prematurely, fluid comes out, and they have what is called a dry birth, right? Patient may or may not go into labor, provide supportive care and transport. The head of the fetus descends into the woman's pelvis as it positions for delivery. This is descent, and it is called lightning. And as I say, at that point, they're gonna say, okay, I can breathe better now, right? But it means that baby is moving into position, all right? Now the second stage begins when the fetus begins to encounter the birth canal, right? Ends when the newborn is born. Uterine contractions are usually closer together and last longer. Now at this stage, we definitely need to support the perineum. We don't want the perineum to tear. Per the perineum will bulge sig significantly and the top of the fetus head will appear at the vaginal opening. This is called crowning. In the third stage, it begins with the birth of the newborn. Well, let me back up. The second stage can take about one to two hours in a, in a primigravida. It can take about 30 minutes in a multigravida um, patient. Go forward. All right, I think I, my connection has dropped for a bit. So take a take a 15 minute break and we will resume at 1015. I may have to log out and log back in. <clears throat> 